You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Nagaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Johannes Ekström of Avatar. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! Today's episode is sponsored by none other than Greer Amps. Yes, that Greer Amps. I'm sure you've seen their pedals before. I personally just acquired a Lightspeed, their organic overdrive. I really, really like that pedal. It is um, probably one of the most aptly named pedals I've ever played. Organic overdrive. It sounds uh, exactly like that name, you know, what you would expect it to sound like. It's a really, really nice sounding pedal for uh, lower gain, uh, medium gain settings, and it'll uh, push your amp in all the right ways. So check out Greer Amps. They've got a ton of, oh, a ton of super cool sounding dirt boxes, not to mention the Black Tiger Delay. I don't even know. They have so many things. They, I need to go on their website and check them out again. It's been a while. I think Greer's been up to some serious shenanigans lately. So, yeah, greeramps.com. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm your host, Blake Lyon, and with me today, I have somebody who you may not think about uh, being an important part of the guitar gear collecting process, and this guy is named Hank Failing, and he manages Old Town Music here in Portland, Oregon. How you doing, man? Hey, how's it going, man? Pretty good. It's what? It's uh, Boxing Day today? Is that what they call today? I think it's officially Boxing Day. (laughs) I don't have any boxing planned. (laughs) <laughs> um, today, so I feel like I'm letting everyone down, including yeah. Rocky. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's like boxing, like you know, punching, or if it's like boxing, like you're getting rid of all your Christmas boxes. <laughs> That's probably more <laughs> accurate. Which, they in that just, case, I I might do that today. Yeah, they should just call it recycling day. That'd be make way more sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah, I thought uh, we've been trying to make this happen for a couple months. Um, I know you was off in Europe and doing some other things, but I thought it would be really interesting to get, I don't know, I think people sometimes don't think about the um, person behind the counter at the music store as being as important to their purchasing process as it is. I mean, a lot of people buy online, but a lot of people still come to the store and they say, hey, Hank, what's up? Uh, What about this new, you know? jhs whatever and you know you kind of have to stay up and 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 know what you're talking about and i thought it'd be interesting to kind of get your side of the story Um, yeah probably the best way to start uh would be to just kind of go through your musical backstory and your history with with old town and and go from there okay um well i play guitar and i play bass um I love playing with synths and drum machines and stuff like that too, and I love pedals. Um, but I've worked at Old Town Music for this year in 2017 will be um, 20 years, um, and I started out as just like a customer of Old Town Music, um, and formerly when it was called Denny's Music, um, and. Basically, I just love gear and playing around with it, and I love selling stuff to people just because selling people gear is fun, and it's almost like a uh, sort of like I get to be like I get to buy the gear because I'm helping the people buy it and everything like that. So you know, I always loved pedals and amps and just making noise and doing crazy stuff, and gear is just fun. You know what I mean? And so it's fun to kind of um, 
be the guy that's sort of the uh, uh, the surrogate uh, purchaser, if you know what I mean. So like somebody comes in and they're like, oh, like I really want to get into recording. And it's like, well, what do you, what's your computer? Oh, I've got like a MacBook. And it's like, dude, yeah, let's get you like this interface. And what are you doing? Like, okay, let's get you this like vocal mic. And then they're all excited and I know how it is when like I love gear and love to record and do stuff and I just love it when uh I it's fun to like help people buy stuff, you know what I mean? Right. Because yeah. you know what it's like to be on the other side of the yeah, counter yeah. also. And you know, we always like try to kind of think about like making sure somebody's experience is good and positive because you know, we've all been to like stores where we're like God, that guy was t- a total jerk. And it's like, what's the point? <laughs> There's no point mm-hmm. in being a jerk at the guitar store because it's just like, dude, you work at a guitar store. That's pretty awesome. It's not like you're like the asphalt guy, you know, doing road maintenance. That's right. that's, that's a pain. At least to, it seems like it's a pain to me. Um, like every guitar store person should be like happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's how I feel about it. Right. Like you're, yeah. you're in a guitar store, the place that people get excited to go and you get yeah. to go there every day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- that being said, like dealing with human beings can be a drag and you're just like, yeah, whatever dog. And mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> but, and that happens. Um, but at the same time, it's like you, I've done this long enough where I've been like at like, you know, 10 different places emotionally with it. So I'm, and the conclusion I have gotten is like, be happy that you work at guitar store. It's awesome. (laughs) So, so that always helps me through the day. If like somebody's kind of a wanker or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Uh, It's just funny because like I I was telling you before we actually started recording, I I sit down out here to, to record and I was like, oh, let me set my, you know, coffee down. I was like, oh, I, I bought that amp from you. And then I looked over here, and it's like, oh, I bought that Marshall cabinet from you. And I'm like, look at my pedal cabinet. And I'm like, I bought, you know, a, a third of that yeah. from you guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I I mean, there's a couple different stores I go to in town, but, like, my go-to has always been Old Town since, I don't know, probably eight years ago or so. Yeah. It's just like, how do you go about... So, yeah, the atmosphere is one thing. Everybody's always really cool and chill in there for the most part. And, uh, um, but you also seem to have just, I always have to go in there and just see what's in stock. Like, cause there's always something yep. cool and new and interesting. It's not always this, it's never the same experience walking in. So how do you keep the inventory fresh and how do you like constantly have cool stuff? Cause other stores can't seem to do that. Well, it's. I think it's also, it, there's a couple things going on. One, you have to be open-minded to all kinds of gear. You can't just be like, if somebody walks in with like a cello, you can't necessarily be like, no, we're not a cello store. You got to be like, okay, I'm going to buy that cello for cheap and sell it for cheap. Even though we're not like a cello store, we're going to make this like a super awesome deal on a cello. And then when somebody comes in and is like, I think I want to get it or they see a cello for like 75 bucks. They're like, Oh, we should just get that. And then what you're kind of doing is you're like giving musicians stuff for really cheap so that they can do stuff cheaply and be more creative. If you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But that one angle is basically kind of saying, not saying no to gear. Um, the other angle is we go out on these road trips. So Pat Rice who owns the shop, Pat's owned the shop for like 20 years now. Bought it from Denny Handa. Um, Denny had the store since 1964, like off and on. So we've got this long lineage dating back about 50 years. Um, but Pat's got this huge panel van. And in the panel van, we can put like over 100 guitars and probably like 30 amplifiers, and, which is nutty. And so he'll drive out in the middle of nowhere, go to other guitar stores, pawn shops, We'll talk to people on Craigslist, just whoever's got something, as long as we can make some money on it um, and make it worth like putting gas in the tank, uh, mm-hmm. we'll like get a ton of stuff. So say about three times a year, Pat will come in, um, he'll do a whole week or so, and then the shop is just loaded. 
And if you have more things for people to buy, then they're going to bring you more stuff to trade in. So we do like tons of trades, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like a guy will be like, oh, I want to get a blue sky from Strymon. And then they'll bring like eight pedals, you know, and then we've got eight more used pedals. Um, mm-hmm. And then we have a ton of used stuff. And then a guy like you comes in and is like, oh, yeah, it's a used Digitech like reverb suite. Mm-hmm. Um and so it's like this cycle where if you can kind of keep this cool cycle going where like, you know, you're always trading with people and people are always trading stuff in, then it sort of like keeps the gear going and then like it just keeps the place flowing. And then we're sort of in the middle of that making money and making a living, which is awesome. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like it's like over the years we've sort of like, you know, made it so that our customers can trade things in and out really easily um, and make customers know that, that, that they can trust us and then we're not going to try to rip them off. And we've got a really like solid way that we do trade-ins and, um, you know, we just are like, Hey, we'll give you 60% of what we'll sell it for on trade-in and then tell them what we're going to sell it for. And then people don't feel like they're getting jacked around. Um, right. We try not to do that thing where it's like, well, what do you want for it? It's like, you know, you never want to be like, you don't want to ask too much for something when you're trying to sell something. You don't want to ask too little. It's kind of nicer just to have an expert just just be like, it's worth this much. This is what we're going to sell it for, and we'll give you this much. And then they go, oh, okay, that seems fair. And then when they come in, they see that you put what you said you are going to put on it, and then they know that they can just trust your word. And they'll just If you tell them something's awesome, they'll believe you. You know what I mean? Like that, that's just a, Trust is a pretty important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a... It's a, actually a classic marketing thing is that you're supposed to try to develop trust with your customers. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I'd say that you've done a really good job with that so far. No, thanks, And I've man. experienced, you know, I've experienced that firsthand. Um, I mean, the last thing I came in there and bought was um, the uh, uh, that old uh, 56 Martin for my yep. dad. Yep. Um, the family, you know, we pooled our money together and got that for him for his 50th birthday. And but at the same time, it was like I was a little bit hesitant because I thought it was awesome and I thought it yeah. played really good and sounded beautiful, but it's totally not something he's ever asked for, or, or expressed interest in in any way. You know, he he te- he's always wanted like a J forty five, but I was like, this guitar is just so cool, and I, I remember kind of telling you guys like it's so cool, but I don't know if it's his thing, and. Um, it ended up being his thing, but you guys were like, well, listen, if he doesn't <laughs> like it, he can just come bring it back. It's no big deal. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, yeah. well, then it's there's no risk there. Whereas yeah. some other stores would be like, well, t- see you later. You bought it. You know? Yeah. There's, there's a theory over the years that I've gotten from that. And like, because I've been doing this for 20 years, uh, well, almost 20 years, it's kind of like I've had all these different theories and... Luckily, I've done it so long that I, I've figured out, I think, where the wrong things are and the right things are. And it's, if, you do the, if you think of this as a store, if you're like, if you let people bring things back because it wasn't the right thing for them and just not worry about whether that sale happened or not, what happens over time is all of their favorite gear came from your store. And so, like, you know... it. it it's sort of subjective whether this guitar or that pedal is going to be the right thing for the right person. Um, and you know, if you're flexible with people, then all their good stuff's going to be from you and they're going to view you as the good store. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Which is cool. You know what I mean? And, and that's what we want. Um, because if we're like the good store, when you want to sell like that SG standard and you could put it on Craigslist or you could take it to like eight other stores, you're going to take it to us because you trust us, and then you also view us as the place that wants that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so then that helps bring in more gear for us, which is super cool. I mean, the easiest way for us to get gear is when people sell it to us or trade it to us because then we don't have to hustle. We don't have to, like, go out of our way to find it. We're already at the shop. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just, yeah, you, your customers are supplying you with your inventory, which... Yeah. Is super handy and yeah. helpful. Um, one thing too um, that I've noticed, it's like you guys are 
I've been in some other stores, ironically one that's no longer around. Mm. Um, and it was like, hey, man, uh, I really am interested. In particular, there was a store in, that is no longer in existence mm. that uh, there was a, a, a 65 Jazzmaster mm. up on the wall. And that's okay. exactly what I was in the market for at the time and still kind of am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like looking actively for a vintage Jazzmaster, and I was like, "That one looks awesome." Okay, uh, you know, can I play that? And they go, the guy goes, "We don't let people play our vintage guitars." Yeah, uh, I was like, "It's that one." So you expect that me to drop? Yeah, uh, they had it way overpriced too. Yeah, you expect yeah. me to drop that much money, and I don't get to touch the guitar first? No, yep. no. <laughs> That's just. <laughs> I just think that's a bad business. It's that one store that you're talking about that closed down like in the last year, right? Yeah, a year or two years ago or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the one thing those guys would do, and we used to be right next to them. Um, they, I hate this because this is the thing you shouldn't do, I think, is like, hey, so the guy goes, customer goes, can I play that? And let's say it's a $2,000 guitar. As a salesman, you're like a little worried somebody's going to ding something up, especially if it's a mm-hmm. new thing, which I can understand that. But you got to let people play the guitars. You got to let them fall in love with it or else they're not going to buy it. These guys used to be like, well, let me see your money. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, dude, that is really offensive. And, and also just like, if you have something for sale, people need to be able to play it. And then the other angle is, even if they aren't going to play it, if they're being respectful and they respect you and the gear and everything, uh, it's kind of like, let them play it. <laughs> let them know what right. a 65 Jazzmaster is like so that people have opinions of certain kinds of gear, because I think that's kind of important. Um, but yeah, that kind of attitude in a store is, is, is a bummer. And, you know, I've been to plenty of stores, like, in town or out of town where that happens and it's a real bummer and it's like why does that have to happen <laughs> you know well and it, it's yeah. weird too but because all the 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 best stores that I've been in yeah um mostly the, the only real reference points I have for that would be Portland and Nashville because yep. when I went to Nashville we made a point to visit all the stores yep but they the the good stores all had a thing in common they all had great stuff yep and the people there were like yeah uh, here's here's the thing play it enjoy it like yep you know i at, at your store i played like a 54 gold top for an oh, hour yeah yeah uh, you oh, know. And it was a 52 gold top <laughs> it was a 52 was i a think 52? so yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah. yeah well, it was like three years ago but yeah. then like, that guitar was awesome and it was like i just want to play that i'm not yep. gonna i'm not gonna buy it but i really want to play it you're like yep tear yep. it up yep and you know i go to uh, Carter's Vintage in Nashville and, you know, had all these old big muffs and all these, like, vintage maestro fuzzes and yep. all this stuff, and they just pulled them all out of the case, yep, yep. sent me in the back room, let me jam on them. I mean, uh, it, just <laughs> the stuff's got to get used, you know what I mean? Like, if, if you have a vintage guitar that's really cool and it just doesn't get played, it's going to start playing like crap, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. if it gets played every day for, like, half an hour or more, it's going to have a warmth to it. So that, like, let's say it's a $10,000 guitar, if that thing, like, plays like it's dead, like, the guy who's got 10000 bucks who really knows what's going on is going to be like, eh, maybe I'll wait on this thing. But if, like, the first string note that he hits is freaking awesome because, like, it's been played every day for half an hour, he's going to be like, all right, I'm going to buy this thing. And then he throws the mm-hmm. MX card on the counter. Um, so it's kind of like, I think things need to be played. You know what I mean? They're made of wood, and they're, well, the guitars are, and, like, Mm -hmm. they're, like, kind of alive, you know what I mean? And if they don't get played, I think they just sort of die and fizzle a little bit. Yeah, I think there is something to that, and there's also just, like, the simple point of if somebody's putting their hands on it every day, you know, at some point somebody's going to come and be like, yeah, you know what, uh... the neck on this thing's all bowed. Yep. Whereas you don't have time to play every guitar in the store every day. So it's like somebody will go like the neck on this thing's all messed up. Can you you might want to adjust it? And then like, <laughs> like you're not going to get that if you don't let people touch the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
customer feedback, I guess, is is pretty crucial in yeah. well, you might, that regard. Yeah, you might find that maybe like there's a fret that's high or needs to be dressed down or something like that. And it's a it's a bummer when somebody looks at something and they're like, I'm gonna buy that, and then they play it and then they change their mind. That mm-hmm. sucks as a salesperson. And you can feel that like when you see them, you're like, oh, that guy's gonna totally buy it. And then he, they play it for two seconds. They're like. Eh, this sucks. And then like they <laughs> put it back on the rack and you're like, oh man, I, if that guitar had played right, like that guy would have bought it like that and it would have mm-hmm. been sold. <laughs> do do customers, uh, I, I think I already know the answer to this, mm. but do customers get that, like get a look in their eye when they see a thing they've been like eyeing or thinking about and they're just like, ooh. You can usually tell like when somebody's going to pull the trigger on something like pretty mm-hmm. quickly, like usually like right away. Um, just because people are like, you can tell in their eye and their face, like they're like, I want that. That would be awesome. And, and, uh, which is always fun. It's just fun when people want to buy stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm still kind of kicking myself over that old, uh, K, uh, hollow body that had the three, like, uh, the three pickups in it here, like six months ago that I didn't, I played it for like an hour and I really wanted yeah. it. Yeah. But... Was that the one with the Decided to... speed bump pickups in it? Or was it a Calvinator yeah. stuff? Okay, yeah. Yep. Had the speed bumps, and I was, like, so in love with it. And then I made the responsible decision for once in my life and didn't buy it, and now I'm still mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how it is with us. We get stuff in all the time. Like, I'm sure we'll get, like, another K speed bump in sooner versus later. What, yeah. One thing I, I would like to put... since since I've complained about it so many times on the internet, but never directly to you. And it's not a complaint about you. It's my own fault. Um, If you ever see this guitar come back through, if you would snag it and let me know, uh, I traded to you. So I bought that 1965 Melody Maker probably three years ago or so. Okay. Um, uh, uh, One of the two two pickup ones, double cut. Okay. Okay. Really like that guitar, but what I did is I traded a partial trade for this um, probably late 60s uh, Japanese short scale thing. Uh, Mm. It was labeled Marquee, and it had a giant headstock and uh, four pickups Mm. and all these switches and stuff. And ever since I did that, I went back to buy the guitar back because I was like, I should have just ponied up the extra money. It wasn't that much money. Uh, And it's gone. And I have never been able to find it. I think it sold on Reverb here a while back, uh, oh. and I missed it. But if that thing ever comes back through, I want it back badly. Okay. And I could probably identify it as the same one just from body scratches and stuff. Do you remember if it had, like, <laughs> did it have gold foils on it, or did it have those, like, funky-looking, like, Strato pickups on it and whatnot? That's, it was like, yeah, it wasn't gold foils. It was okay. these weird, like, Strat-style pickups, but they didn't sound anything like a Strat pickup. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. And they were all microphonic, so you could, yeah. like, scream in it with a bunch yeah. of fuzz, and it sounded <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are cool. Yeah, it, that's how it goes. Like, if you're buying and selling gear, there's going to be, like, four or five things over the course of your life that you're going to be like, why did I sell that? I mean, mm-hmm. I remember 20 years ago when I got rid of a Japanese Jaguar to buy, like, a Paul Reed Smith. And I'm not a Paul Reed Smith guy. That was just, like, a dumb move. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm like, a fender, fendery fender kind of guy. And... Like, some dude brought it into the shop actually, like, maybe three years ago. Oh, whoa. And he was talking about putting it on Craigslist, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll totally buy it. And then, like, I was kind of, like, being a little on the cheap side. I should have just told him, like, whatever you want, I'll buy it. Like, Mm -hmm. and then if he said something ridiculous, I'd be like, oh, man, that's so much more than what I can spend. Um, But I was trying to be a little cheap and be like, oh, maybe I'll get a good deal on this. Um but then he just sold on Craigslist or something else. He was like moving to the East Coast. But now it's gone. And but you know, things change, you know, that's the one thing I've noticed is like be like glad with the gear that you do have if it's gear that like inspires you to make music. Mm-hmm. Um and sometimes the gear that you had back in the day that you wish you had like wouldn't do the same thing for you as it would like right now, you know what I mean? 
That makes sense. Yeah, it's sort of like you change. It's kind of like if you think of it like your girlfriend or significant or other, you're like, when I was 20, like if I was 35 and had that same girlfriend, it'd be totally messed up. But at 20, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of like that for me with gear. Like, like, but I'm glad with, I'm glad with, I'm glad that I have what I have. You know what I mean? But there's a few pieces Absolutely. I'm bummed that I let go. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was like my lesson. And now, you know, of course, that this is probably a bad thing, but it's like turned me into a hoarder. I'm like, I can't get rid of anything ever. Because like yeah. I, I got rid of that one guitar that one time and I'm mad about it. Now I just like, ha- I just like had to build, you know, this studio that I'm sitting in right yeah. now, this little shred shed, just because it was like, well, this bedroom's full. Wait. Well, I can't get rid of anything because I'm a hoarder and I have to keep everything. And now I'm sitting here in this building. That Do you have an outdoor I... building outside of your house for music stuff? Yes. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it was originally yeah. intended to be like a you know place to do some home brewing and, and like recording and stuff. And, and the recording and, and stuff will probably still happen eventually. Yeah. But like I got everything moved out here and yeah. went... There's no room. There's no way I'm going to be able to do homebrew out here also. So yeah. it's just become a music area, um, which has worked out really well with doing all this tone mob stuff because it's given me a place to actually be able to ring things out the way they're supposed to be, yep. you know, like turn the amps up and yep. get everything cranking, which I couldn't really do in my bedroom. So yeah. It's actually been a good thing. Well, and like because like tone mob is like a thing that you do and thing that people know about, it's kind of nice to have that like in a separate little room in a separate little house outside of your house and outside of your life. So like kind of psychologically you step into one door, you're doing this other thing. You step out of that door and you're doing something else. That's true. Yeah, that's true. It's also made my wife extremely happy Uh, to not have to hear my (laughs) banging and clanging and (laughs) fuzz all the time. She was subject to, all the time for yeah. a, a good while before yeah. this was built. <laughs> nice. Uh, but yeah, so I know, <clears throat> excuse me, mm. you've you've been kind of involved in the music scene here for a long time too, doing various things and various projects. Like recently you did a thing for Voodoo Donut, which yeah. most people know about. Yeah, so... Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, there's Voodoo Donut, which is, you know, a crazy donut store in portland a uh, really fun place to visit lots of wild stuff uh they have a record label called voodoo donut recording and um they do a lot of vinyl stuff um in the past i had my own record label uh for about maybe six or seven well, more like six years uh, called failing records failing records was uh, a label that i started to basically just make compilation albums of Portland bands. So I used to do these double CD discs that were made up of all Portland bands. And it would have like, you know, like 40 to 45 bands on it. And then we'd sell them for like seven to 10 bucks, depending on what time uh, it started out as a $7 thing. And then I bumped it up to 10 because I was like making no money at it. Um, and I've been buds with the guys that do voodoo donuts and uh, Jay uh, was running the label and he was a friend of mine. And, um, I was like, and after I stopped doing the failing records, I was like, man, if you guys ever want to do like a comp or something, I would love to put it all together. And then maybe we sell it through all the voodoo donuts. And I'd mentioned it to Jay a couple times and then we're sort of like, well, let's get together. Let's do breakfast or let's do a beer or something like that. And, um, so basically we put out a single disc, Um, with I think 22 or 23 bands on it, all from Portland. And then we're selling it for $9.99 at all the Voodoo Donuts uh, and online. You can also download it too. Uh, So what we want to do is make it into a yearly thing that we do where um, there's a compilation that happens every year. We'll do an all-ages kind of all-day festival thing where a bunch of the bands that are on the compilation album play um there's voodoo 2 which is over um out in southeast which has a huge parking lot and that's the perfect place to do it um so to me it's really important for there to be like free all ages shows happening in the summertime because i remember being a teenager in portland and seeing like you know 
tons of rad Portland stuff and like, you know, uh, you know, seeing like Elliot Smith's old band, uh, Heat Miser and stuff like that and Hitting Birth mm-hmm. and Hazel and all those guys. Um, and when I was a kid, a teenager, those are the things that like super, super inspired me and like the reason why I do music now and the music reason why like I've worked at a guitar store for so long is things that I did when I was uh, in high school. And it, most of it was either really cheap or really free. Um, so those kind of things are important to me. Uh, making a compilation is important to me too, because what it kind of does is it um, kind of like puts all those bands in a time capsule. And let's say in like a hundred years when we're all gone and nobody's going to know anything about these bands because um, they weren't like huge top 40 bands. Um, there's only going to be limited ways because if all of our information is so like, um, let's say everything's saved information wise, like all the music is saved. It's like, how do you bookmark something to say, take a look at this if there's like a billion bands to listen to. Right. So if you do a comp like that, um, at least it's like a little bit of a, you know, a bookmark sticking up in the air that says, take a listen to this. And so the people that get put on there, hopefully in the long run, like people are going to hear that stuff, you know, and be like, oh, that's what it sounded like in like year 2016 in Portland, Oregon. Um, or at least that's one thing that was happening. Um, right. And so to me, that's all kind of important stuff. It's like building a history book. Um, and so hopefully it's something we're going to do every year with Voodoo. And, and Voodoo's like loves doing stuff that's outside the box. Um, you know, they're not like a normal, like Starbucks-y kind of place. They're like the complete opposite. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So it's great to work with those guys. So I, I have a question. Since you're kind of exposed on a much more concentrated level because you're doing this to like the local scene, are you noticing any trends um, in in bands around here in particular? Like I've just kind of sort of noticed at least and i'm i'm kind of biased because this is where my own band lies but seems like we're in this big 90s throwback whether it's a bunch of grunge style bands coming back or whatever the case may be it just seems like right now in portland the thing is to be a 90s style band i don't know if that's accurate or not but i know it is for my band and i've seen a few (laughs) others that fit that bill as well are you seeing that at all i don't know i'm sort of like my vibe on it is I don't think people are necessarily consistently all going in the same direction. I think it's more like, I don't know. It's sort of hard for me to, like, I kind of grew up with music in the 90s. So to me, like, I guess maybe it's harder for me to hear 90s throwback, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because, like, maybe, maybe that's where my head is at. I don't know. So like, it's hard for me to hear the difference in a way. And, and and other people have mentioned this to me. I think it's people that are maybe a little bit younger that didn't necessarily, um, you know, they were maybe too young to go out and do stuff or, or weren't into music when all that stuff was happening. Um, so I think it's easier for those guys to like hear stuff as nineties throwback. Um, I mean, how I always do things when I put things on the comp, it's not about like, it, it it's like what excites me and um if it all sounds like synth rock or if it all sounds like punk or metal then that's what it is mm-hmm. um and i think what's happening in portland is i think there's like an insane amount of stuff happening and i think it's just a matter of like uh just just seeing it you know what i mean there's just it's there's an overwhelmingly amount of there's an overwhelming amount of stuff in portland i mean i think i kind of like did like this math equation trying to figure out how many bands are in portland and i think like i don't even know probably like 2000 or so (laughs) so like it's it's and it's probably even more than that honestly i mean people move to portland all the time that are and they want to come here and do music the, the the only thing kind of bums me out when people move to Portland is they say they want to move here for the Portland sound. And to me, that just seems really weird. Um, like, I don't really feel like there's a Portland sound to me. So I sort of feel like when somebody says that, maybe they're chasing something um, that doesn't exist. 
I don't know, at least on me. Um, um, yeah, as it's as much as I said, there's this this '90s throwback thing. I yeah. still don't know that that necessarily means it's the Portland sound. I don't know what that means either. Yeah, it um, it sort of worries maybe, me too because when somebody's sort of chasing something, um, moving to a place to chase something, that's sort of like okay, like I don't know if that's like the thing you should have done. I sort of feel like as a musician, you should be, um, you know you should chase something that's inside you and be like, and sort of like build up this, like stoke this manic creativity in yourself and then press record. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I can imagine moving somewhere to be more inspired. Yeah. Um, I, I could mean, also imagine just drive, you know, deriving, inspiration from simply being somewhere yeah. you know I, well for instance like uh my buddy leon who runs pelican noise works like yep. he visited new york city and was super inspired and yep. wrote a song that's on our album yep. about that particular you know time yep so i think you can get inspiration from places but as far as moving somewhere to chase the sound seems odd yeah um, and I th i sort of feel like I've had multiple people tell that to me and they're sort of like, it always seems like it's sort of people that are like, Oh, I moved from Brooklyn or I moved from San Francisco or whatever. And they're kind of like, I moved here to get the Portland sound. And it's kind of like, you should move here if like the rent is cheap or if you like the weather, um, <laughs> you know, or if you're like one of your best friends just moved up here. Um, um, it just seems weird to me. Like if I moved to Detroit to get the Motown sound, it'd be like, no, I would move to Detroit because houses are like 25 bucks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't know. It's, but you know, I, I can't necessarily judge anybody for what their creative process is because if they get the result or if they get a result that they're happy with, then I can't really say anything bad about it. You know what I mean? Cause mm -hmm. I don't know. Music is awesome. <laughs> so oh, I, I, story. I definitely don't want to crap on anybody's awesomeness. Right. I, I wonder if maybe like, maybe there is a sound that we're not really yeah. hearing because we're too close to it. Like you said, I, I think you're probably right. And, you know, had like, you know, we had never, if we had never lived here, if we'd never grown up here, if we'd never visited, there's probably a consistent sound that sounds cool to us that um we feel like that we would feel like is in the portland water um you're probably right <laughs> well, i don't know yeah, it's just yeah, yeah that's yeah. gotta be something but yeah. to me like uh the decemberist blitz and trapper and mm. red fang none of those bands sound the same to me yeah although chris uh, chris from uh chris funk from decemberist just produced the latest red fang record yes Isn't i think that... he did the last one too oh no yeah you're right i think which seems insane to me. Like I, I don't hear those guys sounding the same at all. Um, but actually kind of gets me really excited because I'm like, wait a second. If Chris from the December is, is doing Red Fang, what's Red Fang going to sound like? That's like, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, it is. Yeah, yeah. Which is why music is rad. Yeah. I mean, I think the consistency <laughs> that I hear from all those bands is they're all good bands. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and they all make they're all making good sounding music to me. And um, I don't think it's like a filter or a microphone issue. I think it's a just people making good music. My, my, yeah, I yeah. I would agree that other than that, I know they're all from Portland. Yeah. Uh, I just simply like all those bands, so yeah. that's. <laughs> but yeah. I don't think there's any consistency in sound. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah. maybe people would listen to that and say, "No, there's this weird thing that you guys they all do." I yeah. don't know. It it could maybe. be that maybe there's like a it, there could be something in the process. Maybe they're doing things a little bit more analogy, and you know maybe they don't do the same kind of high production that a lot of mainstream stuff kind of does. If you know what I mean, like with mm -hmm. the way things are like compressed a certain way. And it could be that, like, I mean, Portlanders do tend to be kind of somewhat traditionalists. So, you know, if it's their coffee or their pizza or their donuts, um, they're going to go the kind of traditional route or the old school route in general. Um, and I yeah, sort of or feel at least in 
yeah. very inspired by that process. Anyway. Yeah. Like, the general consensus in Portland with amplifiers is that tubes are good. Um, and there's people that definitely play solid states and are making awesome music. But it could be that, you know, things like that kind of stuff maybe adds to the Portland sound. You know what I mean? Um, could be. Yeah. It, it could be, too, that we're just a very, like, rock town. Like, yeah. in general. And as far as, like, most mainstream sounding things these days aren't that way. Yeah. So maybe that I don't, I don't have any idea, but like, it's, 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 I feel the same way about back in the day when there was the Seattle sound. Yeah. I, I didn't, I, <clears throat> there was like an aggression and dirt and fuzz all kind of involved, but those bands don't necessarily sound the same to me. Yeah. I don't think Soundgarden sounds like Nirvana. Yeah. But maybe I'm wrong. Well, it's kind of like this. When Soundgarden and Nirvana got mainstream popular, meaning like people in middle America or people that were watching MTV knew about it, um, it sounded completely different than all the hair metal crap that was going on. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I shouldn't say hair metal crap because there's people who appreciate that. Um, Anyways, long story short. It can be fun. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Me personally, like I can't, like I'm not into like shreddy shred stuff, you know, or like Floyd Rosey kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like me, like I wasn't really, I just didn't really like music. Like I had, you know, the White Album and I had Diva Freedom of Choice and I had Jan and Dean, which was like, you know, Beach Boy style stuff. And that was like the three Mm -hmm. albums I had. And then I didn't really like music other than than those three tapes uh, until, um, oh wait, I think I had Public Enemy. I was kind of into Public Enemy. I had a couple of like those. But anyways, I didn't really like music until I heard uh, like a bunch of stuff coming out of Seattle, like Nirvana, like when um, kind of Bleach kind of came on the scene. And then never mind, like when that happened and people were showing it to me and it was like, whoa. I'm I'm gonna do music. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> um, and before that, it was sort of like going to Portland things. You know what I mean? Um, but I think that just like it, the production and the style and like you know the the fact that you could kind of like you know kind of grah, 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 like with your voice, you know, was kind of a new mm-hmm. thing. And and the sound of the distortion was different. And like you didn't have to be an articulate guitar player to be a good guitar player. Um, I think those sort of things were sort of what the Seattle sound kind of was and that like that was acceptable. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which, good thing for me because I am not an articulate guitar player yeah. at all, I as mean, you've heard. No, no, it's totally cool. I'm not judgmental. <laughs> I mean, the, the only thing that like annoys me is when people sort of like, you can, you can hear them playing their music um, but you can hear that they're kind of just playing to themselves versus the imaginary band in their head. And mm-hmm. I think people should be thinking big picture when they're playing their music. Like imagine this band in your head while you're playing. Um, and when you sort of hear people just wanking and sort of like listening to themselves only, it's sort of like, I don't know. There's something that's just sort of like not inspiring about that. And that's when I'm sort of like, ah, great, I gotta listen to this guy. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> and yeah, you know what I mean. But you know, I'm sure I wink and listen to myself too. But it's just sort of like, um, I sort of think like the best people that I've heard when I hear people like try out gear and stuff like that tend to be the ones that sort of have this like, there's a whole another band happening um, in their head, and they're sort of that one little piece. Um, making it awesome in their own mind and you and if they're making it awesome in their own mind it's sort of like it just sort of sounds awesome by itself but yeah that's why when i come in you only hear me play one note that's it, the whole time. <laughs> you're just doing that one little rhythm part yeah just, now, just that one note just don't just, it's not because i'm a terrible guitar player it's yeah. because i'm playing to abandon my head that's what yeah. i'll just tell yeah. everyone yeah from yeah, now yeah. On. yeah thanks for giving me that excuse yeah 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 <laughs> I try not to be too. No, you, ju- I try not to be judgmental because it, it's you know we're just the guys selling people stuff. I shouldn't be too like you know judgmental on what somebody else plays. It's 
it's not really our place to do that, you know? Um, mm-hmm. It's, I mean, so I try not to be, I don't want to sound too judgmental when I say something like that, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? I, I don't want to make people feel bad about what they play, but yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it, I used to be a little bit like when, in my younger days, I used to be a little bit self-conscious about the fact that I wasn't very skilled. Yeah. And now I'm just kind of like, maybe it's just being older. I'm just like, whatever, this is what I sound like, so here we go. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. It's kind of like it, we're all a lot more skilled than we think we are is the thing. And there's also a skill in just being comfortable with what you are. And if you... It, and I think that it's, you just have to embrace yourself. And that's the real skill, I think, in my opinion. It's sort of like, um, if you're just kind of like, I like what I'm doing and what I'm doing, I think is awesome. I think that's good enough. You know, I don't think you have to worry about, um, being able to, you know, play a certain song a certain way, a hundred percent, like maybe if it's somebody else's song, but just make you, you and make yourself happy with what you do. And then I think you're there. Um, because I think otherwise you're kind of chasing something that like doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Um, right. Yeah. And like I'm, I'm like I think I'm a decent guitar player, but I also like just like what I do. So it's kind of like if you like what you do, it sort of just doesn't matter otherwise, because you're entertained and you love what you love. Um, and people have definitely been like, oh, dude, you were awesome when you did this. And it's like, oh, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. That's awesome. But if I'm, like, really happy with what I did, then then that's kind of it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I – uh, this is kind of going – we're going in a, in a strange direction. But no, I like that's it. cool. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I've kind of, like, just, just came to the conclusion that, like, my role in any musical, like, endeavor – like, if I didn't write the song – uh, or even if I did, it's just like I just try to like find what I can add yeah. to the song yeah. more so than like I need to shred everybody's face off. No. Sometimes I try to do it and I fail, yeah. but uh, I I just like always approach it with the mindset of like, okay, this guy's doing that and that guy's doing this. Maybe I'll try to do something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to fit in there. Yeah. And I think that's come from the fact that in my band we have three guitar players yep. and i think we all approach it that way and that's why we can all play like what might essentially be the same chord but we have everything set so completely different that that it all fits together somehow yeah. i think yeah. we're just very conscious of trying to fit with each other versus overtake each other and i think that's kind of where i try to sit as a whole with music stuff well. I, I think, hope. I, I hope think, I come across that way. I think that's the way to do it. When you're playing with people, like leave some openings for each other. And especially when you get comfortable enough with the people that you play music with, um, where you kind of like are all kind of psych, you know, like you're all sort of psychically connected. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where like if you know that you leave a little part open, they're going to hear within a nanosecond that you left that open for them and they're going to come in and do something. Um, or they're going to like comp your part an octave higher or something, you know what I mean? Um, and add Mm -hmm. a little, little beep on the end of it. Um, and that's an awesome place to be with your band. And like, I'm sort of that way with my band, uh, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, by the way, where we're all pretty good about leaving each other space. Nobody's like really stepping on each other and I like being at that place. That's awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. We're sort of we sort of just do something and then all everybody else reacts to it in like pretty much the right way or just sort of uh we don't really like kill each other, which is awesome. Mhm. Yeah, it's a it I I think that's something that that it just takes creating things with the same people repetitively before yeah. you'll actually get there. Yeah. It, I know it was never like that in my early days. It was always like, who can play the coolest part? Yeah. Uh, and like, kind of be the shining star of the song. Yeah. And um, it, it. I mean, it wasn't fully like that, but it's what it felt like at times. Yeah. And then by uh, nature of doing things that way, 
uh, we were never very tight. So yep. <laughs> it's, it's part of it, I think, is sort of a musical maturity that you have to get to. And you're sort of like, you're basically thinking like, it, you just get to a musical maturity where you don't have to be the center of attention all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's way more awesome when things are like that. It's kind of sure. like if you went and saw like a really awesome soul band and it's like if the lead singer is just like awesome and blowing everybody else off the stage, it's cool. But it's also really cool when the rhythm section, it goes back and forth between the soul singer blowing your mind and then the rhythm section doing a part that's just blowing your mind too. And then the horns come in and then that's blowing your mind. So it's like, your eyes are doing a pinball machine all over the stage and your ears are going nuts um, mm. versus just one person um, on a stage of like 12 people. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. I just yeah. had this kind of thing happen um, a little while back. I went and seen Sturgill Simpson for the mm. second time. Mm. The first time I seen him, it was super like super stripped down, like more traditional kind of hard country type of thing. Um, this time... I've never been to a concert that had that many instrument hmm. solos in my life. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Like, everyone soloed. Like, on every song, it seemed like. It yeah. was like, I and it was, like my head was almost spinning, because I was like, what is that guy doing? What is that guy doing? <laughs> and the horns were killing it. Everyone yeah. was killing it. And even though it was a, quote-unquote, Sturgill Simpson concert, mm. um, he was, he did exactly that. He, like, he let the band just like it was just ripping. It was crazy. Hmm. I, I've never seen a concert like that before. It was insane. Hmm. Where was and that? Not at? at all what I expected. It was where, weird. Where did you see that guy? Uh, I seen him the first time. I seen him at Mississippi Studios. Okay. Uh, during that uh, chili cookoff that happened. Chili cookoff. Uh, a couple years ago. Oh. Yeah, they did a chili a Portland <laughs> chili cookoff. That sounds awesome. It was really awesome, <laughs> and he actually opened for uh, he opened for Lucero. Huh. Um, and then this time he came back and it was at the, uh, oh boy, my brain just failed. Mm. Not the Schnitz, but the other theater. Um, um, oh, the other one. I know what you're talking about. It's, um, geez, who is that? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I totally know. It's the Keller Auditorium. The Keller Auditorium. Yeah. Yes, it was the yeah. Keller Auditorium. So a substantially bigger venue. He's gotten way more popular than the first time I'd heard about him or seen yeah. him. Yeah. Um, but uh, he's actually up for a Grammy this year, which oh. is super weird, and I'd never expected that to happen. But well, he's yeah, he's up for album of the year. The I don't know. The funny thing about the way things are right now, it's sort of like, in some ways, the music industry is kind of like so squished and kind of distorted in a way that like. Um, that like lots of things can kind of like become album of the year now um, because like it's just interesting the way things are like it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if like you know crazy albums become album of the year you know what I mean um, everything is just insanely accessible these days and mm -hmm. things move so quickly and in some ways, things are so decentralized from a promotional aspect, whereas, you know, 20 years ago, things were kind of very centralized. Um, I mean, you could, I mean, like, any one of our bands could make an awesome album at home by ourselves um, and then put it out there and then start touring and then if everybody picks up on that album, I mean, it could become like the best album of the year. Um, which is pretty That's awesome. That's true. Yeah. I it, mean, it's, it's the control's been taken back a little bit yeah. on some levels. It's hard to make um, money, but at the same time, like everything's <laughs> completely accessible now, which is kind of awesome. But yeah, it, and that's something that I've talked about, like with the, I, I don't know if you know, but I do another podcast, mm. um, fairly regularly with the Brian Wampler called the uh, chasing tone. Oh, okay. And we've talked, we've talked about that one, that subject a lot about like, how do you make money uh, as a musician, which ironically, neither of us make money as a musician, but yeah. we have a pretty good idea of how 
you would go about it. And it's awesome. You know, honestly, yeah. it's a lot like running a business. Oh, no, um, it's absolutely like that. It's the, the people that I see making a living being a musician are all kind of doing certain things. They're doing certain things consistently to each other. And what they're doing is they're like, they're being consistent in general. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, <clears throat> they figure out um, where they want to play and um, they tour a couple times a year and they revisit the same places a couple times a year. Um, they put out, you know, an album or two or something um, every year. They're doing stuff. Um, mm -hmm. They're promoting consistently. I mean, it's just like, you know, with Tone Knob, you're consistently promoting to people. Um, and I think most businesses, that's the way it works. Like, if you're consistent with people, like, you know, there was a guitar store in town. I don't know if you ever went to this place. But they're inconsistently open. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so, like, and this is a little story. I don't even know if you know if it ex exists. But, um, and it's like this with a lot of places. Like, if you're like, man, it's Tuesday and your thing says you're open on Tuesday at, like, you know, 11 to 6 and it's 2 o'clock and you're not here. And it's like, if the third time you go to that place and it's the same exact thing, you're not going to go back the fourth time. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if you're, I have not been in to this particular store unless I just got lucky and the they happen to be there. <laughs> it's like it's right next to Cabal and Bread, like a block or two away from Cabal and Bread. Like, oh no, I've never been there. Yeah, I, uh, I know what you're talking about, but I've never been there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just like I love guitar stores, so it's I really love just poking in, and um, I think that you know, like one thing that kind of made me feel like we always, we, when we were a really small store, we're like 3,500 square feet right now. So we're kind of like a good medium sized store, but we used to be mm -hmm. like 1100 square foot, small little dinky store. And, um, the one thing that we did differently, like the first couple years, actually right from the get go when it was old town was we were open seven days a week. And in Portland, um, I think, all the other stores were five or six days a week open, even if they were a bigger store, um, right. which now sounds really crazy, right? Um, but at the time, you know, Portland was doing that thing where like, you know, they'd be closed on Mondays. I, that just drives me crazy. Um, or like Sundays and Mondays, they'd be closed. Um, mm -hmm. But anyways, it, since we were available seven days a week, um, you know, dudes that had like a twin reverb would come by because they're like, I went to this place and they were closed and that place was closed and then you guys were here. So then we ended up getting more gear because of that, which was great. And we got more business, mm -hmm. um, which in retrospect just seems crazy that they didn't stay open. Um, but yeah, I think. It, yeah. And it's well, and on a Sunday, too. I mean, that's most people's day off. It's like I have time to go to music store today. Yeah. Um, but yeah. half of them are closed. Yeah. What and, the heck? and when you're doing retail, you got to kind of do like if everybody's normally closed on a Sunday, it's like you should be open for retail. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. not just because it's Sunday, you should be closed. It's like, well, like if you want your business to do well, you should be open then. <laughs> you know what I mean? So right. we try to be open as much as possible and, um, you know, make it so we, it makes sense for us. But now well, we're, I'm... now we're seven days. Well, we've been seven days a week since the get go, but yeah. Right. Well, and that's a good point that you made because, uh, when again, when I visited Nashville here a while back, I, I had a few stores I wanted to check out. One of them being Eastside yeah. Music in Nashville, and I just could not get there during like normal person time because we were yeah. also doing like a bunch of tourist stuff. Yep. And I was like, oh, they're open till I don't know if they still are. I don't want to yeah. speak out of turn, but yeah. like when I was there, they were open till like nine o'clock on one night. Really? And I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I went in there and I was like, can't believe you guys are still open. This is awesome. Yeah. And the guy that was working there was like, well, here's the deal. Like, there's lots of guitar players in Nashville. Yeah. And yep. there's people playing gigs every single night. And sometimes people go, oh, I broke a string last night and I really need a string before tonight's gig. Yep. You know? Uh, so they're like, we want to be that store. I was yeah. like, wow, that's yep. amazing. So, and also smart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you definitely have to think about things like, you know, if the store is open, you're paying employees. And if you got three or four employees, you got to pay that. It gets expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing, too, is if it's at nine at night, it's like people want to go home and have dinner. 
Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so like me personally, like we close at six thirty, and, um, Oh, I know. Yeah, you know. Oh, that's right. You always, <laughs> that's right. Hey, there's that guy that gets here at, at 620. No. Yep. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. But Hank, I need a fuzz. I need yeah, a yeah, fuzz. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, if we were open till nine every night, I'm sure we would get a few more sales here and there. Um, it's been a thought. I'll, well, yeah. I also don't think that, no, at least not yet, I don't yep. think Portland has the Nashville thing going on where there's literally like, yeah multiple shows going every single night with you know like there's like, probably at any one time in nashville there's probably a hundred plus guitar players playing a show yeah at any given time yeah so i don't think we're there yet yeah i agree i i, I think that's probably the thing it seems like it'd make more sense over there but it's still it's uh, rad totally yeah it, it was cool and it allowed yeah. me to get in there and allowed me to pick up a uh Caroline Guitar Company, uh, Mete or Reverb, and it's one of nice. my favorite Reverb nice. pedals right now. So it all worked out. Yeah, um, I've been wanting to put in like I don't think we're ever we're, we'll ever do this, but I've always thought it'd be great to have like a uh, vending machine, just full of stuff like you know like strings, picks, cables. I know some stores do this occasionally, but I've always wanted to have a vending machine. So you, if you want to get after hour stuff and put like you know uh, stage tuners and stuff like that, and I'm like maybe an SM58 in there and then people can put like their credit card in and like get like a get stuff when they need it you know what i mean or like earplugs and things like that and if all the clubs know you can do that then they'll be like oh dude just go up the street four blocks and go get like a 20 foot cable from those guys right um, I always thought that'd be really funny. <laughs> it would be funny and yeah. it's, that would be a very portland thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it is. It's things like that that you're like, oh, man, I need this capo. Yeah. I need this cable. Like, I forgot that my patch cables went, you know, south on me last yeah. gig or whatever. It's like those little stupid things you forget. You don't forget your guitar. No. But you might forget you broke your high E. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, Hank, we went on and went on to things I didn't even think we were going to, but it was really fun. Um, but what I, I should do... Um, before there's there's a couple things we got to do before I get to the last question. That well, there's one thing in particular. So, where can everybody find Old Town Music on the interwebs? Okay, so our website is oldtownmusicportland.com, and Sweet. that's our website. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We kind of do stuff on Twitter, but to be honest with you, I just do not get Twitter. I don't understand it. Um, <laughs> I don't either. I know. I mean, I know people do it. Um, and, um, but anyways, Instagram, Facebook, that's a good place to find us. Um, okay. And then uh, if you come to Portland, uh, just Google search us or look it up on the map. You'll see us. We're not too far from downtown Portland. Uh, we're right on uh, the corner of 11th and Ankeny, which is just south of Burnside, which is the main street go. in Portland. And I might be there. Yes. There's a good chance I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you come by. Come visit Blake. Yeah. Is that, actually, that was that might be a deterrent. I won't yeah. be there. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be there making racket. Yeah. Uh, call ahead and I'll, they'll shoo me out the door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. And now for the uh, the closing question, since we're, we're right at that hour mark, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask this, and I also don't know it in all the times mm. I've talked to you. Mm. Uh, Hank, what is your favorite kind of pizza? Pizza. I think that I would go with something that has like little ground sausage balls on it. That's really mm -hmm. yummy to me. Mm -hmm. um, maybe pineapple would be awesome. At least two other kinds of vegetables like peppers, probably some olives. So like a combo would be super rad, but definitely mm. with the little sausage balls because that's my favorite. Yeah, the little Italian sausage yeah. on there. Hell yeah. <laughs> is there a, uh, a since since we're local and we can nerd out for a second, mm. is there a favorite uh, in town that you have? For Portland, I don't know. Like there's this little place called Hometown Pizza that is like three blocks away from my house. And I think it's my favorite only because it's right next to my house. 
Oh. <laughs> um, but they do like that pizza where the um, the dough's kind of on the flat side. It's not like big cushy like bready pizza like you know like mm-hmm. Domino's and whatever places they got that like real bready pizza. That stuff just to me that's like a bad news. I like a flatter dough pizza, and then it's like you know they're like a cash only place. Like I think it's a guy and his wife and. It, you know they don't take like plastic which is totally infuriating but at the same time <laughs> like that's kind of what that place is you know what i mean anyways mm-hmm. so and then they cut it like um oh no wait that's the other place they don't cut it like that i was going to say this one place like cuts it like little squares and stuff but that's chicago oh, pizza or whatever it's called um but no hometown pizza it's right next to my house <laughs> all right i'll have to check it out yeah yeah All right, man. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate it, and I'm glad we were able to finally make this happen. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, guys. For Hank, this is Blake, and as always, good luck and good tones. Whoa, it's 2017. Guys, it's 2017. Can you believe it? Episode 50, first episode of 2017. Wow. And NAM's coming up. There's so much. Oh, and I got all these projects I'm working on. I don't even know where to start. How am I supposed to have a decent outro when I can't even think straight? Um, I want to say thank you for an epic 2016 because it was truly incredible. I got to uh, partake in a lot of things I never would have ever thought that I would get to experience. And it's all because of you guys tuning in, hanging out, on the Facebook group, on Instagram, emailing me, tweeting, all that good stuff. I'm around. Um, thank you so much for being part of the community. It's great. And listening to the podcast, and just thank you for 2016. And 2017 is uh, shaping up to be even better, so thanks in advance for that. So take care of yourselves, and have a good week. One last thing before we totally sign off here, I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.